Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. Wi-Fi is a technology that's almost universally known to most. It's the go-to method for connecting to the internet at home, at work, or even just a cafe. So you might be surprised to find out that there was a battle raging between Australia and the United States. It was a battle to determine who received royalties and credit for the invention of Wi-Fi. From 2012, US consumers were forced to make a $400 plus million dollar donation to an Australian government agency, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, or CSIRO. Most US consumers had no idea that this took place. This was because the cost was hidden in the huge array of tech products. Products like wireless devices and chips, from Lenovo, T-Mobile, AT&T, Dell, HP, D-Link, Microsoft, Intel, and Netgear. All of this happened because of a patent lawsuit over a key technology in Wi-Fi. The patent retroactively applies to practically every wireless-enabled device sold in the US. You may also be surprised to know that the enabling technology of Wi-Fi came from a failed experiment to detect black holes. It's an interesting story with a few twists and turns, but to understand how we got here, we must first learn about what Wi-Fi is and how it works. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. So what is Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is a radio wave. Simply put, radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetism is one of the four fundamental forces in nature. Without going into too much detail, electromagnetic waves are basically oscillating disturbances in the electromagnetic field. It might just be worth spending a second to talk about electromagnetic waves. It's pretty interesting. So the cool thing is, Different frequencies of oscillation give rise to different forms of electromagnetic waves, from radio waves at the lowest frequencies, and light and gamma rays at higher frequencies. Starting at radio waves, these waves can be meters to kilometers long, and can be used to listen to the radio in your car at frequencies between 87 and 108 million times per second. At about 30 times that frequency, these waves can be used to reliably carry more information than just sound. Wi-Fi. Bluetooth, cell phone signals, all use these higher frequencies. These can be 10 centimeters long or smaller. If we push further, increasing the frequency by about 10, you enter the domain of microwaves. These waves specifically make water vibrate along with their frequency, billions of times a second. These vibrations of the water molecules cause heat, and when your food contains water, this heat can warm your whole meal. Pushing even further and increasing the frequency and energy even more, you end up in the infrared domain. These waves are now micrometers long and can be used for seeing heat patterns or in your TV remote control. Pushing beyond this is visible light and these waves are now nanometers. This is the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that humans can see. Pushing further, we enter ultraviolet light and this is where it starts becoming dangerous for humans but ultraviolet light is useful for sterilizing medical equipment and also killing bacteria or viruses, or even checking counterfeit money. Increase the frequency even more and you have an even smaller wavelength, and this results in X-rays, which can penetrate your soft tissue. Then finally, at the highest frequencies of all, you have gamma rays. This is great for killing cancer, but it also fries your healthy cells. X-rays and gamma waves are usually only brought from radioactive activity in nature. So in summary, Wi-Fi, visible light, and X-rays are all just one and the same thing, just electromagnetic oscillations, but at different frequencies. As mentioned, Wi-Fi was at the lower end of the spectrum. Here's an artist's representation of what Wi-Fi waves could look like if you could see them. So now we know what Wi-Fi is, how does it work? Wi-Fi uses electromagnetic frequencies that oscillate at 2.4 to 5 billion times a second. These rapid waves can be used to encode and decode information. Wi-Fi is simply a protocol for allowing digital information to be transferred across high-frequency radio waves. 
this makes it perfect for high data transfer applications like the internet. You can think of Wi-Fi as a very rapid two-way radio. Inside your laptop or phone, you've got a wireless chip that can function as both a transmitter and receiver of information in the form of radio waves. You can think of it like little Morse code signals being sent back and forth to each other, but at billions of times a second. These signals can then be decoded and interpreted as information. On the other side of your home, you'll likely have a wireless router, which has another transmitter and receiver. Connecting both your laptop and router together on the same radio frequency band is what allows them to communicate with each other and send data back and forth between each other. Data in the form of videos, audio, websites, and more. In 1997, the American-based Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, formed a committee that came up with a technical standard for transmitting information across these high radio frequencies. This was the start of what would be known as Wi-Fi. Just a quick note, Wi-Fi actually doesn't stand for anything. The name was created by a brand consulting firm back in 1999. They needed a more catchy name for IEEE 802.11, and I think they achieved that. So now, the world had a standard for transmitting information across these high-frequency waves, but there was still a problem. Getting this data to be robust and error-free was the key to getting Wi-Fi to work properly. This is where the Australian scientists at the CSIRO come in. The CSIRO works in a whole bunch of different areas. Science, chemistry, energy exploration, and even mineral sciences. This organisation receives a lot of its funding from the government. They have thousands of scientists throughout Australia. So the road to solving the Wi-Fi issue all started when a CSIRO astrophysicist, John O'Sullivan, was researching how to detect black holes the size of an atom. The issue was, the radio waves from these black holes would become distorted as they travelled to Earth. To fix this, John used a set of mathematical equations called Fourier transforms. He adapted them to astronomy to remove the distortions. A Fourier transform can take a signal and decompose the frequencies that make up that signal. So that's pretty cool. John would never detect the black holes, but he later realised that his work in Fourier transforms and radio waves could solve another problem. When the organisation was trying to create a high-speed wireless network, they found that the radio waves would bounce all around the room John coded his Fourier transform equation method of cleaning up signals into the very logic circuit of the chip. This cleaned up the signals that were bouncing haphazardly around the room. Now instead of bouncing all around the walls and ceilings and messing up the signal, the computer on the receiving end could easily read the signal and understand it. Furthermore, this chip was small, small enough to fit into a laptop, and also cheap to make. The secret to the chip was to split the data stream into hundreds of pieces and then reassemble them rapidly. The previous state of the art of this technology would require a room full of equipment to work. The result of John's chip from the CSIRO was greatly improved Wi-Fi signal quality. It was fast and could transmit a signal while reducing echo. This happy accident beat many of the major communications companies around the world that were trying to solve the same issue. John O'Sullivan explains, quote, some of the original seeds were sown in radio astronomy. Curiously, it was a failed experiment to detect exploding mini black holes the size of an atomic particle. I certainly had no idea where things would lead. Back then, we had set out to do a wireless network at 100 megabits per second. Many people thought we had rocks in our head to try and do such a thing. We really thought it would be big, and I'm just blown away at how big it has become. End quote. O'Sullivan and his team were not the only ones seeking this breakthrough, but they were the quickest and best. These patents were filed in 1992 and 1996. It's worth noting that the fundamental technology for this kind of error correction has existed and has been used since the late 1960s when NASA sent the Mariner craft to Mars. But making it cheap and in the form of a small chip was something new. Also of note, the work that became Wi-Fi wouldn't be possible without the standards agreed upon by the American Electrical Engineers Association in 1997. It wouldn't be until 2012 when the patent was recognised and the royalties were paid to the CSIRO. 
So to answer the question, did this Australian government team invent Wi-Fi? Not exactly. There were many pioneers before them, but the chip that made it cheap and feasible was indeed an Australian invention. And it all came from a failed experiment to detect atomic sized black holes. The more you know, huh? It's also a great anecdote for those who say that this kind of scientific research is pointless. You really just don't know what technologies can come out of it. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video or at least found it interesting. If you're interested in science, technology, business or history, feel free to subscribe to this channel. I'm sure you'll find some interesting stuff on here. Alright, so my name is Togogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion. I'll see you again soon for the next episode. Cheers guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's new thinking.